that that link's also going to be in your Canvas note uh, announcement this evening. Okay. All right. So two three, we're going to talk about functions, and you can't see it on screen. Let me get that up there. Got this computer doesn't like to remember what to do. There we go. Two handsome young men there. The oldest scored his first soccer goal Saturday. Proud dad moment. So that's fun. He was excited. We were too. So, all right. Two, three. Talking about functions. Uh, a function is based off a mathematical definition of a relation. And in an algebra class, when we talk about a relation, we're talking about a set of ordered pairs. This goes back to what we talked about last uh, class meeting with, with the rectangular coordinates and the ordered pairs and that idea. So a relation is just a set of ordered pairs. And <clears throat> that might, you know, the way they write a set, curly braces, and then we have the ordered pair one, two, uh, just a comma there. one, two, and then another ordered pair, three, four, and maybe another ordered pair, five, six, really creative set of ordered pairs there. So just three ordered pairs in that, that relation, uh, and, and that's what that is. The domain of that relation, domain deals with the X values. The X values for that, rela that relation, one, three, and five. The range, if domain is X values, range has to be what? Y values. The range, two, four, and six. The Y values for those ordered pairs, okay? So, any relation we have in is a set of ordered pairs. They have a domain, they have a range, even if it's not a function. A function is a relation that meets specific uh, circumstances or specific rules. A function is a relation in which one value from the domain corresponds to one value of the range. An X relates to a Y. Okay? That kind of the rule of thumb that this is saying one value from the domain corresponds to one value of the range is that we cannot repeat x values do not repeat x values okay that's what you want to remember to decide if something is a function or not you're checking x values it is okay to repeat y values it is not okay to repeat X values. And the way I tell my high school students this when we talk about it, because they're young, they all start to date and stuff. And, and uh, so they, you know, you always have that guy in class that just makes a lot of different people get a lot of X's. Uh, and I would say if you want to function properly, don't repeat your X's. It seems to help. And they all get it and they understand that, what that means. So, here, if we're going to be a function, we can't repeat x values. And so that, that's how it helps me remember that, that we can't repeat x values. If you want to function properly, don't repeat your x values. Okay? Or don't repeat x's. Okay. All right. Now, we're going to play a small game here. We're going to play, is this a function? Uh, be on the Game Show Network next, next fall. And why or why not? Okay. So we're going to look at different ways that relations can be expressed to us. We could have a set of ordered pairs like we do here. 
and say the ordered pair is 1, negative 6, 3, 5, negative 2, 4, and 7, negative 13. So that's our set of ordered pairs. That's our relation. We want to decide, is that relation special enough to be a function? The only thing it has to do is not repeat the x's. So look at the x values. We had 1, 3, negative 2, 7. Are there any repeats? No. So is that a function? Yes, it is a function. Why? Doesn't repeat x values. Doesn't repeat x's. Easy enough. So they could list it as a set like that, a set of ordered pairs. Another way that a relation could be expressed to us is with a table, like what we did in the labs there when we built those tables. They may already have a table built for us, and they might have the numbers 4, negative 8, 3, negative 2, 6, negative 5, and 4, negative 6. Okay? So this is another way of writing this. Order pair, 4, negative 8, 3, negative 2, 6, negative 5, 4, negative 6. Is that a function? Why not? Yeah, no. Those four. X value repeated. That's why it is not a function, because an X value is repeated. So, set of ordered pairs could be a table to list that. Another way that they could express a relation to us is what's called a mapping. And mapping is just bubbles. You've got a domain bubble and a range bubble. Okay, and they're just going to put the X values in the domain bubble. You might have 4, 6, 7, negative 3, and then some Y values in the range bubble, like 100, 200, 300. Okay. To get the ordered pairs, because we're testing relations, is the relation a function or not? To get that relation a mapping, what they do is they just take arrows and draw the connection to the ordered pair. So the X values are in the domain, because the domain is X. And they just draw some arrows there. So they might have 4 going to 200, 6 going to 100, 7 going across to 200, and negative 3 going to 300. Okay. And then, so the ordered pairs are 4, 200, 6, 100, 7, 200, negative 3, 300. Okay. So it's just another way of writing the ordered pairs. Just a, a mapping is just those bubbles. Is does this one pass the rule for function? Yes. What's repeated though? Yeah, the range value, a y value, and it's okay to repeat y values, not okay to repeat x values. So this one is a yes. No repeated x values. Later on, like math one ten. We talk about what's called a one-to-one -one function. This one would not be is a function, but it's not a one-to-one -one function. One-to-one -one functions are just pairing up only one in both directions. This one is not that, but just kind of a preview of some things you'd see. Um, they could also express a relation as a graph. So I'm just going to sketch a graph. You don't have to be too precise with this. I'm just going to draw a coordinate plane and then draw a graph on there. That graph might be you know, this line right there. That blue line there represents every ordered pair that could exist on that line. You could not even count how many there are. It's an infinite number of ordered pairs. Right? But that blue line represents all of those ordered pairs. Okay? When you're given a graph, 
The best way to test if that is a function or not is this thing called the vertical line test. Okay. Vertical line test. And the rules of the vertical line test are that I place a vertical line everywhere I can on that graph. I'm looking for a place that it would touch that blue line two times at the, you know, twice at the same time. Okay. If I place a vertical line on this one, if, you know, it's right there. Does it, how many times does that vertical line touch the blue one? Once. What about right there? What about right there? Once. Doesn't seem like I'm going to, no matter where I put that vertical line, this one only touches the blue line one time every time. Okay. If that's the case, then it passes the vertical line test and is a function. Okay, so this is yes, passes the vertical line test. Okay, let's look at one that maybe doesn't. So I'm just going to draw just a small coordinate plane. Doesn't have to be perfect. Here. X and Y axis. There's a graph that has an equation. I write it up here for you. It doesn't really matter what it is. We got the graph. That's what we're testing. If I use a vertical line on this one, if I put it just right here, it only touches once. But if I put it over here, how many times does it touch? Twice at the same time. Okay? So that's a failure of the vertical line test. What that means is, you know, when I drop that vertical line on it, I've got this x value giving me two different y values. And the way a, a, a function works is you can only have one y value from the same x value. So if that x value was a 4, this blue line says, oh, well, 4 gives me a negative, maybe that's negative 6, and maybe that's positive 6. It's two different y values that go with the same x value, and that's a, that's a no-go when it talks about functions. Okay, So this is not a function. Fails vertical line test. What that tells us is there's a repeated X's. That's what the vertical line test checks for us. If it only touches once anywhere on there, then it passes and it is a function. If I can place a vertical line anywhere on the graph and get it to touch, Two places at the same time, it fails and is not a function. Okay, that's what we've got to check for. Okay, all right. Let's look at this problem. I'm gonna draw a little coordinate plane and get us a little graph going here. Don't have to be too precise. I'm going to tell you what order pairs you need to know. Here's an ordered pair. That ordered pair is negative 1, negative 4. And then we get this graph. Is this a function? That's the first question we want to answer. Is that a function? Does it pass the vertical line test? Well, that's a yes. Second question we want to answer is what's the domain of that function? Well, the domain, well, what does this blue line represent for this problem? Whole bunch of what? Whole bunch of ordered pairs. We can't even list them all. There's so many of them. That blue line just represents all those ordered pairs. Okay? Now, domain deals with what? What part of an ordered pair? The x values. Okay? So x axis on the coordinate plane is the side to side, right? So what does this graph continue to do as it goes to the left? <coughs> 
keeps going up, and then it also, the x values keep going that way, right? And then what's it doing to the right? It's keep going out toward infinity that way, okay? So the domain of this thing, it goes forever to the left and forever to the right. So that would be all real numbers, okay? So this is a domain of all real numbers, x such that x is all real numbers. That's set notation. There's another notation that we use. It's called interval notation. Interval notation is where the infinities come in. What this tells us is that we're going from negative infinity, that's all the way, way over here. There, come get there. Negative infinity is way over there. Positive infinity would be way that direction. Okay? So, negative infinity, this starts at negative infinity, goes all the way up to positive infinity. Interval notation is it's a hard row to hold because you, it looks like an ordered pair, but it's not. It's an interval notation for the domain. Okay, We'll get better at doing that as we go through the semester. I'm going to try to bounce back and forth between the two so that we can kind of master both of them at the same time. Uh, our book tends to go here more than here, but you do need to know this for some things that we're going to do. So I'm going to try to introduce you to that as we go. Sideways fix. The side, it's like a sideways eight. For, that's the that's the in, infinity symbol. Infinity symbol. Infinity symbol. So you read that negative infinity to positive infinity. That's that's how you read that. All right. Third thing. Range. Range deals with what? Y values. Okay. So when you're talking about y values, you know, rank or on domain we talk about to the left and to the right. So range we're going to talk about from the bottom to the top. What is the lowest y value on that graph? Negative four. That that point that I put there was important. Okay. So the negative four is the lowest y value. What about the y values when you go up? They keep going up to infinity, right? So the range for this thing is going to be all the y values as long as y is greater than or equal to negative 4. For interval notation, it'd be we're going to use a bracket negative 4 to positive infinity. Hey, the bracket tells me to include the negative 4 because it's one of the y values that I've got. We can never use a bracket on the infinities because we can never really get there. Right? It makes sense that you can't use it. So a bracket means we're including negative 4 in one of our y values and we're going all the way up to infinity. Y is greater than or equal to negative 4. That means we're including negative 4. We're going to things that are bigger than that. These two say the same thing. This is set notation. This is interval notation. So we're going to try to introduce those as we go along. And I think we start with the smaller stuff. It, it gets a little easier. Okay. Let's look at another graph and see what we can do with it. If we can get the domain and the range of that. Coordinates plane. Okay. Which part? Alright. Why that's a bracket there and not a... Yeah. Okay, it's a bracket because we look at our y values. This negative 4 is the lowest y value, but it is one of our y values. So it's included in the y values that we're calling our range. So we're going to include it in our interval. Our interval, if we put a parenthesis here, that's saying negative 4 is not one of my y values. It's only things that are bigger than negative 4. 
But because I have that ordered pair that's on my graph, I know negative four is one of my y values. So I have to include it when I talk about my range. That negative four is one of my y values. So I have to put the equal to mark there. And if I'm including it in interval notation, I'm going to use a bracket. It means I'm including the number that I'm writing here. If I use a parenthesis, that means I'm not including it. We can't include it. We never use a bracket on infinity because we can never get there. So you can't you can't include infinity because it never you never even get to it. Once you think you're there, you just add one. You're not there. Okay. You'll never get to infinity on the way. X what about the X bar? That negative four is a y value. Okay. This this is the set notation for the range. The range is how far the graph goes up and down. Okay. This one, the lowest y value is negative four. The highest one we can't get there it keeps going up forever because they had the arrows pointing up. So it went on up to positive infinity. The x values, it was all real numbers because the graph goes all, all the way to the left and all the way to the right because these two arrows, they're pointing up, but they're also kind of veering out to the left and the right. Okay, so that's why it's all real numbers. <laughs> there are no limitations on the x. Let's do the next one, and I think it'll make sense because it's got limitations on both of them, and I think it'll start kind of making some sense with you. All right, so uh, I'm going to plot some points here. That point is 0, 5. That point is 0, negative 5. That point is 2, 0. That point is negative 2, 0. I'm trying to get an ellipse type stuff. An ellipse type change, so a football kind of change. All right. Now, that's our graph. Okay. This is the x axis. This is the y axis. That football shape is the, is the graph that we're dealing with. It has an equation. It doesn't matter what the equation is. We're looking at the graph. First question is. This a function. No, why not? Yeah, you do the vertical line test, it's going to hit twice. I can show that just by doing that. There we see it fails it there. Fails it in a billion other places. Okay, so it's not a function, but that doesn't mean we don't have a domain. What's the lowest x value reading that left or right? Negative 2 is the lowest x value. It's the first one. We read this thing from left to right. Negative 2 is the first one we come in touch with. What's the biggest one? 2, right there. So this one has a domain from negative 2 up to positive 2. So negative 2 is less than or equal to x. It's less than or equal to positive 2. That's how you'd write that as a set notation. Okay. In an interval notation, interval notation to me is easier because you can say, okay, well, if I'm starting at negative 2, I'm going to put a bracket negative 2, and then I'm going all those x values in between there up to positive 2. So I just put a positive 2 there, and it's included, so I put a bracket on it as well. These two mean the same thing. Okay. So that's reading the graph from left to right. What's the first x value you come in touch with? It's negative 2. The last x value is positive 2. That's what our domain for that means. The range what's the lowest y value? You're going to read it from bottom to top. Negative 
Negative five is the lowest y value. Is that on the pair right there? It has a y value. We've got all these y values that are represented on this graph all the way up to here. So from negative five up to positive five. That's right. Good job. What would the interval for that be? Yep. Okay. Again, we don't have to have interval notation mastered this week, but I'm trying to introduce it as we go so that hopefully when we do need it, we got it. All right. It's it's it'll catch on if you hadn't caught it yet. It'll catch on. All right. So now that's if we got a graph. If we've got a graph, we look at it, we see. If we don't have a graph and we've got an equation, there's a little different job we've got to do. Okay, so let's look at finding the domain of equations. Function equations. All right. In the grand world of mathematics, there are, are only a few things that we cannot do. One of those things that we cannot do is divide by what number? We can always, well, I can divide by negative number. You can divide by negative two, negative five. Done. Let's prove this. What number, there's only one number in the world we can divide by? Zero. That is not a defined operation in mathematics. If I ask you to split a candy bar into zero pieces, none of you can do that. If I ask you to split it into two pieces, everybody can do that. Okay? But you cannot divide something by zero or into zero pieces. That's trying to make it not exist. That's what what more now is. Okay? And finding the domain of the functions, that's one of the things that we've got to look out for. So there are only two red flags that we've got to look for. Those red flags, the first one, that's supposed to be a red flag. I know this color is horrible on this thing. Is we're going to look for X's in the denominator. Remember the denominator is the bottom of a fraction. Okay, that's the first red flag. X is in the denominator of a fraction. So that implies we're going to have some fractions in our stuff. That's okay. We got to handle. It. Okay, the second red flag, the only other red flag that can exist, is an X inside of a square root. The reason that that's a red flag is because what if that x was a negative number? Can we take the square root of a negative number? Can't you know? Well, you can, but it ends up getting you out of the real number system and into the complex number system, which is not where we're living right now. We're in the real number system, okay? So we're talking about graphs and all that stuff. The complex number system does not show up in graphs, okay? Only real numbers do. So these are the two red flags you're going to look for. It's the only two red flags you're going to look for. If neither of these red flags is there, then the domain is going to be all real numbers. Okay, the default domain, if no red flags exist, if no red flags in the problem. The domain is x such that it's all real numbers. As an interval, that's from negative infinity to positive infinity. Okay, 
If no red flags exist, that's what you're going to have for the domain. The domain for every problem starts out as this. Then we look for problems with that. We look for red flags. Okay, so I'm going to try to explain that to you as we go here. All right. Now, our job, what letter are we on here? H. Find the domain. Here's our function. F of X equals X plus 4. Really simple one to start. <coughs> so we look at the function. They give it to us in function notation. F of X is the same thing as Y. So it's like Y equals X plus 4. F of X is just function notation for that. So we look at the X plus 4 side. That's the side that could have problems. Are there any X's in the denominator? There's not even any fractions in here. So can't be that red flag. Is there an X inside of a square root? No, there's not even any square roots in the problem. So this one has no red flags. No red flags means the domain is all real numbers. In interval notation, negative infinity to positive infinity. Okay. Both of those say the same things. There were no red flags. That's why that's there. Okay. <coughs> No red flags. That's what, why that one's that way. Now let's look at one like this. F of X equals 5 over X plus 2. Big fraction in there. The red flag. Yes, we got a fraction, we got an X in the bottom part of it. It's okay if X is in the top. That's not a problem. X in the bottom is where the problem happens, okay? So that red flag is that X plus 2 is in the denominator. There's a big red flag. That's, that's where that's at. So what we've got to do is we've got to tell why or what numbers would mess this problem up, okay? If X is in the denominator, you're going to set the whole denominator equal to zero. Okay. What number is it that we can't divide by? Zero. That's why we're setting it equal to zero, because that's the only number we can't divide by. We want to know when is X plus 2 zero. So we set this equation up. X plus 2 is equal to zero, and we solve it. Okay. How do we get X by itself in that problem? Track two. What that tells us is that when X is negative two, the denominator turns into a zero. That's a problem. So that means that negative two is a number that is not in the domain. Okay? So our interval or our domain for this, to write it in set notation and interval notation. All x's such that x is not negative 2. It can be anything else as long as it's not negative 2. It can't be a negative 2 because that would give us 0 in the denominator. So when we solve that, what we're finding is what x cannot be. When we're doing the denominator stuff, set the denominator equal to zero, solve it. That tells you what X cannot be. So in interval or in set notation, all X's such that X is not negative two, not equal to. It's an equal sign of the slash group. Okay? Interval notation. Well, if it can be everything except for negative two, where's it going to start at? Think about domain we're reading from left to right. What's the lowest value on the left? 
not negative two, but negative infinity. Because it can be anything other than negative two. So negative three works, negative four, negative five, all that works. Okay, so here's what's happening. We're I'm gonna be way over here, this corner. We're gonna pretend that's negative infinity. Right? I made it to negative infinity or close to it. Okay. I'm walking along, everything's hunky dory with this, this function, five over x plus two, until I come to this plug-in. That plug-in is negative two. It causes a problem. So I've got to skip over it. Okay. In set notation, to skip over it, we just say x does not equal negative two. In interval notation, we've got to tell where we're skipping to. Okay, we're just going to skip over negative 2. So to hop over a number in interval notation, this is how you do it. We go from negative infinity up to negative 2. We're not including negative 2. So are we going to, if we're not including it, are we going to put a bracket or parentheses? Parentheses. Okay. And then here's how we join it together with the next place we start. We use a U. We'll draw a better one there. Just a U symbol like that. It's not a full, full on capital U. It's just a U like symbol. Okay, that means union. Okay, that's all it means. Okay. When we're walking along here, what number are we skipping? Yeah. Negative two is the only number we're skipping. So is negative one point nine nine okay? Yeah, that is right after negative two. So we're going to pick up right after negative two. So the next piece is going to be parentheses, negative two again, because that, that tells me go all the way up to negative two, skip over negative two, and pick up right after it. And then we're going all the way to where? Positive infinity on that other end. Okay. This tells us skip negative two. Interval notation is not as nice when you're cutting out pieces. It gets a little cumbersome. But that's, it's very descriptive. This only tells me uh, what it can't be. This tells me everything it can be. It can be from negative infinity up to negative two. Skip negative two, then go all the way to positive infinity. Okay? All right. There's our domain. Let's do another one. This takes practice, guys. Let's say we had f of x equals 6 over 2x plus 7. Do another one that's a fraction. Now, is there a red flag? What red flag? X in the denominator. That's our red flag we're dealing with here. What do we do with 2x plus 7? Set it equal to 0. And then solve. How do we solve? What would I divide? What do you mean divide? Where's it time right there? What do you mean? Subtract what? They're not like terms. I can't put them together. I gotta subtract seven because I'm trying to get X by itself. So I'm gonna move this stuff that doesn't have X first, the seven. It's gonna go over here with the zero because zero doesn't have an X either. So I'm gonna move the seven by subtraction. That's the first step. That's negative seven. And then do what? Divide by two. So we're just we're setting the denominator equal to zero and solving that equation. That's what we're going to be doing to find this domain. This tells us that x cannot be negative seven over two. That's that's all it tells us. So our domain, all the x's. As long as x does not equal negative 7 over 2. How do I do that in interval notation? Let's 
Start at negative infinity. What number are we skipping? So we're getting the negative 7 over 2. Union picking up right after that and getting to infinity. That's how you would do the domain for that one. G of X equals the square root of X minus 5. Does this one have a denominator? No, so it's not that red flag. But it does have a what? Square root. You've got an X inside of that square root. So that's a red flag for us. What kind of number can we take the square root of? Or we cannot take the square root of what? A negative. Okay? So, here's our red flag, that square root. So the way you're going to handle that to find the domain is you're going to set up an equation or an inequality. X minus 5, the stuff that's underneath the square root. We want to make that number, we want to make sure that number that's inside of the square root is not negative. What numbers are not negative? Positive numbers and zero. Zero is neither negative or positive. So zero counts too. So we're going to set that up by setting that greater than or equal to zero. Okay. Greater than or equal to zero. Always going to take the stuff that's underneath the square root set it greater than or equal to zero, and then get x by itself again, okay? How do we get x by itself on this one? Add five, simple problem there. Greater than or equal to five. Now here's the difference. That gives me the numbers that work. With the denominator stuff, it gives me ones that don't work. Because I want it to be positive or not negative. If it's greater than or equal to zero, that means it's going to be zero or bigger. So that's going to give me positive numbers. However, that's why I'm going greater than or equal to. Okay, zero is not negative, and anything bigger than that would be a positive number. So that's why I'm using that. I'm always going to use greater than or equal to, though. On the square roots. On the denominator stuff, you're going to set it equal to zero and solve. That's the two rules. That's just two rules that you got to know. Now, what that tells us about the domain. All X's, as long as X is greater than or equal to 5. So, whatever your inequality is here, that's the same thing in your set notation for domain. Okay, so that makes it pretty easy. Interval notation. What's the smallest x value? 5. Is it included? Yes. So we're going to use a what on it? Bracket and go all the way up to positive infinity. Those will be our domain for this particular problem. Okay. Let's look at another one. Let's say we had uh, h of x equals square root 3x plus 5, and then there's a plus 8 on the outside. I'm going to find the domain of that. Which part of that? has the red flag. Yeah, the plus eight, does it have anything to do with it? Not at all. It's only the stuff inside the square root that has something to do with our red flag. So this part is the only part that has the red flag. So what do we do with 3x plus 5? Well, what do we do before that? Greater than or equal to zero. 
because it's under a square root, we're going to use greater than or equal to zero every time. Use the Everything that's underneath the square root. The plus eight that's here doesn't matter. You can, you can want it up, throw it away, do whatever. Okay. 3x plus 5 comes up. Stuff underneath the square root. That's the part we're going to use. Then we're going to get x by itself. What do we do first? We get x by itself. Yeah, subtract 5. That's the inverse of addition. So 3x is greater than or equal to negative 5. One last move. Divide by 3. X is greater than or equal to negative 5 thirds. So then you go over here and you write your domain. All X is as long as X is greater than or equal to that same inequality. What's the interval for that? I'll get half of it. Yeah, negative five thirds with a bracket on it. Because it's in, included. It's gonna take some practice with this. Don't don't just yeah. eight doesn't matter. It's not part of the square root. So it doesn't, the only part that matters is this part with the square root in it. The plus eight on the end doesn't matter. It's kind of like when we were doing the ones with fractions. We never worried about the six that was on top because it, it wasn't part of the problem. The only problem uh, occurs in the X is in the denominator or X is inside of a square root. All right. Yeah, it is a function. Yeah. It would pass, if you graphed it, it passes the vertical line test and, all that fun stuff. All right. So look at this. Like I said, this first section is pretty heavy. It's got a lot of stuff in it. So let's get the next thing in this section. It's a little easier. Mm -hmm. So it's square bracket. That. Parentheses means you're not including the number. <laughs> Bracket means you are. Okay. Parentheses means you're not including the number. The square bracket means you are including the number. With square root problems, you need a bracket because you are including that number. With with the denominator problems, parentheses is the only thing you have. So square root problems you have Yes, ma'am. Rent and denominator problems or not? Rick, you have a question? Uh, so if the problem was squared, and you had square root of the whole sign? Uh, it depends on where the squared was. Uh, you won't encounter that. Because uh, you know, that just cancels it back down and stuff. So that, you won't encounter Good question. All right. All right. All right, let's look at the last, the next to the last thing for this section. Evaluating functions. A little bit easier thing. Um, here's our function. F of X is equal to 3X minus 7. They want us to find F of negative 2. Okay. All that means is plug in negative 2 in the place of X. Work it out. That's all that needs to do. So f of negative 2 means take 3 times negative 2 minus 7. That's negative 6 minus 7. 13. That's it. That means when x is negative 2, y is negative 13. That's what that means. We really have an ordered pair here, negative 2, negative 13. So you're taking whatever number's in that parentheses here, replacing x with it. Whatever's in those parentheses goes in the place of x. And you work out that the, the problem side. This is not f times negative 2. That's f of negative 2. That's function notation. That means the function of x equals 
Negative 13 is the y value. Let's do another one of those. G of x equals x squared minus 3x plus 7. They want us to find g of negative 4. What are we putting in the place of x? Negative 4. And working that out. So g of negative 4 means put negative 4 in the place of x everywhere there's an x. Everywhere there was an x in this problem, I replaced it with a negative 4. I always put parentheses in there with every time I replace. That way I don't mess up a sign. Okay? I would expect you, you know, that would help you, especially if you're typing in the calculator. Okay? Next, uh, we'll be work that out. So negative 4 squared, 16. Negative 3 times negative 4 is positive 12 plus 7. So that'd be 28 plus 7, 35. G of negative 4 is equal to 35. That means when x is negative 4, y is 35. That's what that means. All right, so here's a function written in set notation. It's a set of ordered pairs. It meets the criteria for functions because it doesn't repeat x values. We can do function value for it if they ask us for the right numbers, okay? If they ask us to find f of 3, what does that mean? What does this 3 here represent? An x value. Where is 3 an x value? 3, 1. Three, one. So what does f of 3 equal? 1. It equals the y value. If I ask you to find f of 0, F of zero equals how much? Three. Good job. They're giving you the x value. You go find the y value to go with. That's what they're doing. Okay? Evaluating functions, they're giving you the x value. You find the y value that goes with. Okay? Here, since it's listed as ordered pairs, we don't have an equation to plug that number into. We have ordered pairs to go to. So zero, right there is x is a zero, three is the y. That's what we're finding. Here, f of 3. 3 is an x value. Well, that's negative 3. That's 0. There's 3 is an x value. Its y value is 1. So that's why it's that x. Okay? They're giving you the x. You find the y. That's what evaluating function is. Okay? All right. One last thing in this, this particular section. Increasing... Decreasing and constant intervals. I'm going to draw a small graph here. Try to make yours look close to what this one does.
Disordered pair, that corner there is negative two, six. That corner over here is seven, six. Now, when we talk about increasing, decreasing, or constant intervals, what we're talking about are, are what are the y values doing? Okay. So when we look at this problem, when we're trying to look for the, these intervals of increasing, decreasing, or constant, we're looking from left to right. Okay. So this first little leg here that goes to that corner, reading it left to right, what's what are the y values doing as we go from left to right? They're increasing. So this would be an interval of increase. Okay. So this one is increasing. From negative infinity to what x value? Negative 2. The intervals that we're going to report are going to be the x values. We're reading y values, but we're going to report x values because that's the that's how we read it left to right. That's how we're going to know where to go. Okay. What's it doing from negative two all the way to seven? It's constant. Why is it constant? It's not changing any. It's staying level the whole way. That's a constant interval. So it's constant from negative two positive 7. And I'm using parentheses there because you can't really tell whether it's, you know, right there at that corner, what, which one is it? There's no way to tell. Okay? So I'm just always on the increasing, decreasing, and constant. We're always just going to use parentheses. You don't have to worry about whether it's a bracket or parentheses on that, which is a good thing. Because you can't tell which one's plus, you know, which one where it changed. It's just the place where it changed. Okay? So, and then decreasing. Where's that happening at? Seven, all the way to where? X values, remember? I'm going this direction. It'll be positive infinity. The Y values are going toward negative infinity, but the X values are going toward positive infinity. Remember, our intervals that we're going to report are our X value intervals. But they're going down. That's the y values going down. The x values are continuing to go up. Because remember, here's zero. The x values from here, this is seven. The next one's going to be eight. The next one's going to be nine. Oh, sure. The y values are going down, but the x values are continuing to increase. The y values are ones we're reading, the x values are what we're reporting. Okay? All right. That finally ends that first section. A lot of stuff in that first section. All right. The next two are not nearly as, I don't think, nearly as tough okay, as far as thinking and stuff goes. Okay. So we're going to. A little more, like what I'm saying is it's a little more memorized information in the next one, not so much application of things. It's more memorized information. So maybe that helps uh, helps us think here. All right, um, I'm going to use graph paper just because I want my graphs to be pretty precise as I'm explaining it to you. If you don't have graph paper, that's fine. You'll be okay. Just, uh, you know, just make your graphs kind of look like what I'm drawing. All right. Um, two, six is where we're going next. So we skip from two, three up to two, six, and then we'll get two, seven as well tonight. So two, six, we're talking about graphs of basic functions. Basic functions, when anytime you see the word basic, that means good. This is not going to be too complicated. Okay? It's going to take the, the, the smallest form of, of a lot of functions here. Okay? One thing we're going to talk about is this thing called continuity. Continuous functions over an interval. That just means some sort of domain, x values. 
can be drawn without picking up your writing utensil. Okay, that's a layman's way of understanding continuity. Continuous functions, you should be able to trace the graph and never have to pick up your pencil to skip a number or move to another piece. Okay, continuity, where we got two things that can happen it can either be continuous or discontinuous. Those are the only two uh, options that we can have. It's, it's a one or a zero type thing. So we can have continuous. A continuous graph, an example of that would look like this. And I'm just going to sketch you a, a small graph that's that's continuous. So there's this a coordinate plane. A continuous graph would be something that does like that. I can take my writing utensil and I can start here on this graph and I can trace it the whole way and I never have to pick up a pencil and I've, I've covered the whole graph. That is a continuous function. It would pass the vertical line test, all those things, it's continuous. That would be one. Why? Yeah, there we go. I can start here and go around, but then I got to pick up and jump here to get to the next piece. And that would be a discontinuous graph. Discontinuous. Okay. We'll do, I'll draw you one more that's kind of a subtle discontinuous. Kind of, they try to sneak it in on us sometimes. Might draw us a graph. Like that. And they put that open circle in there. That looks continuous, but that open circle is it's like the negative two we had to cut out with the domain the other while ago. Same thing. You gotta jump over that. So you gotta pick a pencil up to jump over. And start again. So that little circle there, and try to sneak it in on you, but that's a that's a hole in the graph, which means you got to jump over that. So that's a discontinuous graph. Okay. So there's just some examples of, of the continuity stuff. Okay. And, and so that comes up a little bit in this section. You, you'll you'll get some questions about that. Okay. All right. But it's a really easy concept. If you got to pick up your pencil, it's discontinuous. All right, let's talk about some basic functions, their names and what they look like and some information about them, okay? So I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, six functions that I want to want to discuss, and that's the notes for this particular section. We're just going to draw a picture of it, get the domain and range, and the name of those functions on this. So that's, that's what my goal is for this section, okay? All right. Basic functions. The most basic function that we can deal with in this, the first one, is the identity function. The identity function has the equation f of x is equal to this plain old x. f of x equals x. Okay. Y equals X, another way of saying that, okay? That function, the graph of it, coordinate plane, get it line up there. Whatever X is, Y is the exact identical thing to it. So if X is zero, Y is zero. If X is one, Y is one. If x is negative 1, y is negative 1. If x is positive 2, y is positive 2. 
If X is negative 2, Y is negative 2. They're identical, thus the name identity. Okay? Whatever X is, Y is the same thing. Okay? It creates this straight line that goes right through the origin. That's what the identity function looks like. We've got these ordered pairs here. I'm trying to show those dots. They're just the same X and same Y. Always. Identity function always does that. Okay? That identity function has a domain from negative infinity to positive infinity. It has a range from negative infinity to positive infinity. If you know it's the identity function, you know it looks like this. You know it has this equation. You know it has this domain and has this range. <coughs> All of those things go together. Okay, so those are that's some things. You want to be able to recognize the identity function. If you see that graph, you're going to say, oh, that's the identity function. I know this about it. I know it has a domain from negative infinity to positive infinity. It has a range that's exactly the same way because it's identical to the domain. Okay? It has that equation, y equals x or f of x equals x. Okay? Let's get the next one. Function number two is the squaring function. The squaring function has this equation, f of x is equal to x squared. Whatever x is, we square it, and that gets us y. That's what, what we're getting here. Okay? The graph of that, like this. If x is 0, 0 squared is 0, right? So I get the origin. If x is 1, what's 1 squared? 1. If x is 2, what's 2 squared? 4. Same thing happens if it's negative 1. What's negative 1 times negative 1? 1. What's negative 2 times negative 2? 4. That's the graph of the squaring function. Looks a lot like one we, we looked at earlier. Just kind of it's sitting in the center of this one. Because it's the most basic. Okay. Squaring function has that graph. It looks like that. The shape is called a parabola. If you remember that word from maybe a high school math class or something like that. But the shape is a parabola. Uh, headlights on old classic cars are parabolic. They're three-dimensional parabolic, but uh, they're the, those old can headlights, they have that parabolic shape. Reason, because there's some reflection that happens in there that's just unreal math-wise, but uh, neat thing. So uh, that helps me remember that parabolic headlights. But anyway, domain. Domain, if we look at that, what, what direction it are, is the x values going here? It's going up, but the x values are still going out, right? So it's going to go from negative infinity, and on this side, it's going positive infinity. So the domain for this is from negative infinity to positive infinity. Okay? The range, what's the lowest y value on this graph? Zero. Zero. And it goes toward what? Upward to positive infinity and beyond. Okay, we're including that zero. Yes, ma'am. I have to put the bracket because zero does is one of my y values. Okay, because when x is zero, y is zero. Okay. Funny about the Buzz Lightyear comic. My oldest one has the Buzz Lightyear doll that talks and all that stuff. Doll action figure, excuse me. Uh, that, and my youngest one runs to the other end of the house every time he gets to that because he's scared to death of it. We had to figure out why. Because I guess it's because it talks and his mouth doesn't move. So it's always kind of it's kind of freaky if you think about it. But uh, I just laugh at him because he's scared of it, and that's probably not the best thing to do. 
that of the year award goes to me for traumatizing my son with a Buzz Lightyear. But anyway, cubing function. It's like the squaring function, except for the exponent, instead of being a 2, is what? Oh, cubing. A 3. Yeah, cubed is third in the third power. Okay? It's the cubing function. The cubing function. Get the graph up here. Line it up with the points. There we go. X is 0. Y is 0. When X is 1... 1 to the third power is 1. But when x is 2, what's 2 to the third power? Eight. It, it, yo, it gets big quick. 3 to the third power is 27. That's off the charts up here. Okay? Cubing function gets big quick. And also in the other direction, if x is negative 1, what's negative 1 to the third power? Negative 1. What's negative 2 to the third power? Negative 8. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. I'm not real great at drawing the cubing, the cubing function. But it looks something like that. Okay? Now... Domain, though, stays the same. Negative infinity to positive infinity. The range, though, what's the range on this? Yeah, go ahead and, yeah, negative infinity to positive infinity. Because it's going down all the way through the floor, up through the roof. So negative infinity to positive infinity for domain and range for the cubing function. You know what it looks like there, okay? The fourth function is the square root function. The square root function, f of x is equal to the square root of x. I'm going to pick a good x value for this one. If I pick 0, what's the square root of 0? Zero? 0. If I pick 1, what's the square root of 1? One? 1. I'm not going to pick 2 because I don't know the square root of 2. And I'm not going to pick 3 because it doesn't have a good square root. But the, but 4 has a good square root. If x is 4, the square root of 4 is 2. So I would go all the way to the next point would be 4, 2. What would be the next good square root number? Six doesn't have a good square root. Nine does. Five, six, seven, eight, nine. It's three. We get that look. I didn't go through those dots very well. Let's try again. All right. The domain of that guy. Technically, we're going to include the zero because zero is works in the square root, so we got to include that uh, up to positive infinity. So it starts at zero and goes that way. Range. Same thing. It's going to be slow getting to positive infinity on the range, but it'll get there eventually. It's going to take it a while because, you know, we got 1, 4, 9, 16 to be the next and We only climb one rung when we get to 16. When we get to 25, we climb one more. So it takes it a while to get there, but it eventually will get to positive infinity. Okay. So those are the domain range of the square root function. Now, what it looks like. Okay. The, the basic graph will. The basic graph. We, what, our, what we're going to do is we're going to take these and manipulate them some okay. in the next session. So the basic graph 
has this shape. And depending on what kind of transformation we do to it, what it does to the dominant branch. All right. Number five. We did the square root. We did the squaring function. We did the cube cubing function. We did the square root function. So we're going to do the cubed root function. F of x equals the cubed root of x. Sketch the graph of this. Cube root of 1 is 1. Cube root of 8. 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Yeah, there's there's some good there's some good pictures in the textbook. Yeah, they're they're nice. They're a little better artists than I am. I'm off count. <laughs> Oh, I didn't hold it. Okay. Oh, it's so hard to draw. Why is it so easy to draw when it's sitting vertically? Either way. Domain. Negative infinity to positive infinity. Infinity symbol. Oops. Um, what's it? Range. Same thing. Negative infinity, positive infinity. Okay. It's going to take it a long while to get toward positive and negative infinity, but it'll get there. Okay. So the cubed root function out of that. And the last one I want to illustrate here for you is Roman numerals. Number six is the absolute value. F of X equals the absolute value of X. This one is an easy one to remember because it is a unique shape. Absolute value. Can anybody tell me what absolute value really is? It's a number, but... What does that number represent? Uh, here's, here's the reason. Okay, I got positive three. What's the absolute value of positive three? Three. What's the absolute value of negative three? Three. Three. Those are not the same number, yet they have the same absolute value. Negative three on the number line is down here. Positive three on the number line is up here. What's in between them? Zero. Absolute value is the distance away from zero. That's what it really is, is what its definition is. So it's always positive because it's a distance. Distance can never be negative. Distance is always positive. So domain for this sucker. Negative infinity to positive infinity. The range. Bracket zero to infinity. So the basic absolute value function. Just like that. Okay. Study through those. Make sure you know them. Be able to recognize the name of the graph from the graph. Be able to recognize the graph from the name. Know that stuff about the, the function uh, equation and the um, and the domain range. Okay. All right. Last section of the night. Let's get this thing done. It's been a while since 5:30 this morning. So, two seven. Graphing techniques slash transformations. All right. That's what we're going to be talking about. Okay. Transformations, graphing techniques, ideas for this stuff. All right. So there are several things that can happen to a function. Okay. A function could have vertical movement 
horizontal movement. Okay, that, that's what can happen to a function. We can take a function and we can we can scoot it up, we can scoot it down, we can scoot it to the to the right or to the left. Okay, those things can happen to a function. We can also take a function and stretch it vertically, or we can compress it vertically. We can take a function and stretch it horizontally, spread it out, or we can compress it horizontally, squish it in. Okay. What we're going to talk about is what mathematically is happening to the function to make that happen. Okay, so that's what our goal is here. So let's start with stretching and shrinking, or comp let's, stop, let's call it compressing. That sounds more important than shrinking. Shrinking sounds much. Compressing sounds mathematical. All right. Vertical stretch. What happens is you multiply the basic function by some number. A is a number. Okay. A, for it to be a vertical stretch, has to be greater than one. Okay. So multiplying by a number bigger than one, it's going to stretch it vertical. Did y'all ever play with silly putty when you were kids? You may still play with it now. That's okay. I do. That's why I have kids. No toys. Hey, silly putty. When we was kids, newspaper came Sunday. Especially you had the comic, the funny paper is what we called it, and you take that silly putty, roll it out, make you a little pancake with it. And then you get the funny papers and go Garfield or, or Calvin and Hobbes and, and we, we press that silly putty down on them and then you peel it off and the ink transfers to the silly putty and you got a picture on it. Okay? A vertical stretch is like taking that silly putty and pulling it this way. So what it does to the basic graph, if you multiply by a number bigger than one, is it stretches the silly putty. So if it were the squaring function, here's a good example. Remember the squaring function looked like this, right? If I take that and do a vertical stretch with it, that's pulling it up that way. Same thing happened to Garfield when you pulled the silly putty, right? It made him skinnier looking and made him taller. That's what happens with the vertical stretch. The number here has to be a bigger number, bigger than one, okay? Bigger than one, be a vertical stretch. Okay. And do that. All right. Let's do a vertical compression. A vertical compression, you may, I may slip up and say shrink, because that's the way I learned it when I was uh, a student. We changed the terminology to say compression now because it sounds like we're important or something. It's still shrink, but compression, shrink, same thing. So if I say shrink, I meant compression. If I say compression, I meant shrink. Okay. What happens? It looks exactly the same. You're going to multiply the basic function by some number. The difference is that that number is a small fraction or decimal. That A is between zero and one. For it to be a vertical compression, that number that you're multiplying the entire basic function by is a small one, okay? If I've got this squaring function and I multiply it by 0.1, that's a small number that's between 0 and 1, it's going to squish it down, right? Makes it look like it got wider, but it's got shorter. Too, okay, that's harder to do with silly putty. It was hard to squish it down like that, but you could. You could squish it down and make it look like that. Okay, so vertical stretch for multiplying on the outside by a larger number bigger than one. Vertical compression for multiplying on the outside by a number between zero and one. So a small fraction or decimal. Small fraction or decimal. 
for a vertical compression. Okay. Examples. We'll call this example A. What basic function was I using there? Absolute value function. Is that a vertical stretch or a vertical stretch or a compression? Stretch, why? Yeah, number bigger than one. So then multiply on the outside by a number bigger than one. So this is a vertical stretch. Example B. One third X cubed. What's my basic function I'm dealing with there? It's a the cubing function. The cubing function. Multiplied on the outside by one third would do what? Compress. Vertical compression. Okay. Yeah. Let's talk about horizontal. Horizontal stretch. We're multiplying on the inside of the function. Okay? That's a big difference in vertical and horizontal. Vertical things happen on the outside. Horizontal things happen on the inside of the function. Okay? So if it were absolute value function, your multiplier would be on the inside of the absolute value box. That if it's horizontal, it's happening on the inside. Vertical things happen on the outside. Horizontal things happen on the inside. That carries throughout everything we'll talk about in this section today. Okay? So horizontal, if we multiply by a small fraction on the inside, it's going to be a horizontal stretch. So that's like taking this picture of Garfield and pulling the silly putty this way. A horizontal stretch. It's multiplying by a small number. Horizontal things look like the opposite of vertical things. Okay? Vertical, the stretch was from a big number, right? Horizontal, the stretch is from a small number. Horizontal is a... The way I've always remembered that is horizontal had an O in it, and so it was opposite. That's, but horizontal's got two O's in it, so it's opposite. So that's the way I've always remembered that. So horizontal things look like the opposite of vertical things. Okay? So a horizontal stretch, we're multiplying by a small number on the inside. A horizontal. Compression. Looks the same, except for the number. A, it's got to be a big number, bigger than one. Okay. Examples. Said, let's take the absolute value. We need you to recognize inside or outside. The two is on the inside. So that means this is horizontal. Is it a horizontal compression or a horizontal stretch? Compression, why? It's bigger than one. Horizontal compression. What 
what's my basic function I'm dealing with here? Maybe I should write that a little clearer. There we go. The squaring function. Okay. We're multiplying on the inside of the squaring function, so that's why the parentheses. That inside tells us that we're doing something vertical or horizontal. <clears throat> horizontal. Horizontal things happen on the inside. It's a one half. The word horizontal stretch because that's a small number. All right. Now we're in the mood of multiplying. Let's talk about reflections. Not reflex, but reflections. Two different kinds of reflections that we'll deal with. One of them is a reflection across the x-axis. If you reflect across the x-axis, so you've got a coordinate plane here. I take this blue dot here and I'll reflect it across the x-axis. It's going to flip down to the bottom. And that's going to move it which direction? Vertically or horizontally? If it flips from top to bottom. Vertically. Because if I'm, if I'm up here and I reflect across the x-axis, i got to come down here. That's a vertical movement. Okay? So... Vertical movement happens on the inside or the outside of the function. Outside, okay? So what that looks like is a negative sign on the outside of the function. That's a, a reflection across the x-axis. Okay? Example of that. What are we on E? f of x equals negative x squared. No parentheses inside. That negative is on the outside of the basic function x squared. What it does is takes the x squared function and reflects it across the x-axis. So it takes it and flips it down. That's, that's a reflection across the x-axis. So that's a uh, vertical movement because it's happening on the outside. So this is a cross x-axis. The other type of reflection that we could have is across the y-axis. If you take that same blue dot and you reflect it across the y-axis, y-axis is up here. If I reflect it across that, it's going to move, jump over here to quadrant two, from one to two, which moves horizontally. So that's going to happen on the inside. So what that's going to look like, equation-wise, is a negative on the inside. So you might have something like the square root function. You got a negative on the inside. That's taking the x, the square root, the square root function and reflecting it across the y-axis. So instead of looking like, like that, it's gonna flip it over and it's gonna look like this, like the red, like this one on the left. That's what a reflection across the y-axis does. It takes this one and moves it over here. That's what it looks like. So that's a reflection across the y-axis because it's on the inside and that's a horizontal movement okay being able to recognize these things is what we're after here given an equation they're hard to recognize with a graph because I'll, there are ways to manipulate a horizontal stretch and a vertical compression and make them look the same 
by just using the right numbers. So they're hard to recognize with a graph, but they're easy to recognize in an equation. So we're looking at equations and getting information from them, not at graphs particularly. How it is. Okay. All right. Let's get the next thing. Translations, transformations. Translation, what that means is a left, right, up, or down. Okay. We take the basic function and add some number to it. K is a number. What that does is it moves up or down K units. If K is positive, it's plus 3, it's up 3. If K were negative, like minus 5, it'd be down 5. That's, that's what I mean by up or down. That's an outside of the function. It's on the outside, so that's a vertical movement. Anything that's added or subtracted on the outside is a vertical shift, up or down. Okay, or a translation is the make is the big word for that. Vertical shift, plus on the outside is up, minus on the outside is down. Okay, so maybe maybe I should put plus or minus up there. The plus minus symbol, plus is up, minus is down. Else. All right. If we take that function and on the inside we add or subtract something. Because it's on the inside, it's left or right, it's horizontal. Okay? If you add on the inside, you're going to go left. If you subtract on the inside, you're going to go right. That number of units. Okay. Adding on the outside goes up. Subtracting on the outside goes down. Adding on the inside goes left. Subtracting on the inside goes right. Okay. Example. I don't know what we're G. Yeah. What translation is that do? Moving up, right, left, down. Up how many? Up four. It's taking the absolute value function, that V shape, and just scooping it up four units. That's that's what it's doing to the to the graph. So this is up four. What's this doing to the squaring function? Moving it right five units. Good job. That's it. All right, so let's start mixing them all together. We've talked about it. Somebody's going to oh, crap. It's not that hard. It really is one of the easiest things we've done tonight. Okay, we want to describe. Transformations. I'm not going to get too crazy with you. Here's our function 3x squared minus 7. So I'm taking the squaring function and I'm transforming it by doing these two things to it. So it only has two. What does the minus 7 do? 
Down seven. About that three. Vertically or horizontally? Is it on the inside or the outside? Vertically because it's not in parentheses. Anything that's happening horizontally, you're going to see inside of parentheses or inside of the absolute value marks, okay? So this is going to be a vertical stretch. Down seven with a vertical stretch. Technically, we would say by a factor of three, so whatever number you're multiplying by is your factor, stretch factor. Vertical things happen on the outside. Vertical is outside. The minus seven is on the outside of the square root function. The three is on the outside of the square root function. So those, we know that those are vertical movements. E of x is equal to, uh, let's see, uh, let's do absolute value of one fifth x plus x. So vertical what? Vertical shift of up eight because it's plus eight on the outside. What does the one fifth on the inside do? Horizontal stretch. Remember if it's a small number on the inside, it's a stretch. If it's a big number on the inside, it's a compression. The opposite happens on the outside. If it's a big number on the outside, it's a stretch. A small number on the outside, it's a compression. One half parentheses x plus four cubed plus thirteen. What transformations are happening to that the cubing function? Up thirteen. So that's a vertical shift up thirteen. What's the plus four on the inside doing? Horizontal shift, which way? Adding on the inside moves it to the left. Left four. What's the one half on the outside? Vertical what? Compression. Small number. By a factor of one half. Plus 13 is on the outside, so that's why it's up 13. The plus 4 is on the inside, so we know that's horizontal. Plus on the inside is left, minus on the inside is right. Minus has an I, right. Plus on the inside is left, so that's left 4. The 1 half is on the outside, so that's a compression vertically by a factor of 1 half. Just looking at these a little bit and remembering those rules out of that. Okay. Couple more things here. Uh, 
Okay. Let's let's talk about tests or symmetry real quick. What is symmetry? Same on both sides. Okay, so if something is symmetric with respect to the x-axis, that means you could fold it across the x-axis and it would match up. If it's symmetric with respect to the y-axis, you could fold it across the y-axis and it would match up. Okay, so that's that's what we're going to be looking at. Okay, um, let's take a function here. What letter are we on here? L. f of x is equal to x squared plus 4. If we want to test for y-axis symmetry, the test that we would use is we plug in a negative x and simplify. If everything returns to the original, then it is symmetric. y-axis symmetry, we plug in a negative x and simplify it. So I plug in f of x or f of negative x to the problem. If it turns back to the original, goes back to looking just like this, then it's symmetric with respect to the y-axis or about the y-axis. Those mean the same thing. When I square negative x, what's negative x times negative x? Positive x squared, right? Is that the same as the original? Yes. So that is symmetric about the y-axis. Okay. So that's for y-axis symmetry. For x-axis symmetry, another test. Plug in negative y and simplify. Okay. If everything simplifies. the original and there is symmetry about the x-axis. So we take the same problem f of x equals negative or equals x squared plus 4. Remember, f of x is the same thing as y. So this is really y equals x squared plus 4. If we plug in negative y, and then we try to solve that or simplify that back, what we want to do is simplify it back to being y equals. How do I get this to turn back into y? What's really in front of that? Not just a negative, but it's a negative what? Negative one. So it's an easy solve. How do you get rid of that negative one? You divide it to get it to the other side. And I'm going to divide every individual piece by negative one. That's how you get that to happen. It's a really easy problem to do. You've got to know to do it. 
When I do that, I get negative x squared minus 4. Is that the same thing as the original? x squared is not plain x squared. 4 is not plus 4 anymore. It's negative. It's the opposite of the original. Okay? So that tells me this is not symmetric about the x-axis. Not symmetric about the x-axis. One other type of symmetry is the origin. And it's easier because you've already done all the work. The origin, it has to be symmetric about both X and Y axis. If, it, if it's on, only one of those, then it's not symmetric about the origin. It has to be both of them to be symmetric about the origin. So you're going to use the same two tests for symmetry with Y axis and symmetry with the x-axis, those two tests, if they're both yes, then it's symmetry about the origin that you know through. All right. One last thing in this section, and we're done. I promise. Like, kind of like a preacher. I just keep saying one more thing, one more thing, one more thing. Nothing against preachers. I am one from time to time, so it's okay. Odd and even E-V-E-N function. Yes. All right, I'm going to show you the real test, and then I'm going to show you how to shortcut it. Okay? The real test is plug in negative X. It's the same row as symmetry. No difference. Okay? Doing the same thing. Plug in negative x. If f of negative x equals the original, no change. It's even. If f of negative x equals negative f of x, everything is the opposite. So if, if it was positive, it turns to negative. If it was negative, it turned to positive. Everything opposite, it's odd. Okay. So we're going to look at some, some examples of this real quick, and then we'll move on to home. I don't know what letter we're on here. M. A lot of letters tonight. All right. Here's a function, f of x, 8x to the 4th minus 3x squared. If I plug in negative x, I'll show you that test, and I'm going to show you a shortcut. If I take negative x and multiply it times itself four times, that's negative x times negative x times another negative x times another negative x. What's that going to end up being? Positive or negative x to the fourth? There's an even number of them, so it's negative times negative, that's positive. Then there's another negative times negative, that's another positive. Positive times positive is positive. So that turns back into 8 x to the fourth. What happens when I square negative x? I get x squared, right? I get positive x squared times negative 3 is negative 3x squared. Is that exactly the same thing as I started with? Is that the original? Yes. So this is even. Here's the shortcut. Look at the exponents on the variable. 4 and 2. What are both of them? Even. If all of the exponents are even, it's an even function. 
but it's got to be everybody. Can't be somebody, some of the bodies. It's got to be everybody. It's got to have an even exponent. That's the shortcut. Okay. Here's a problem. We're testing even and odd here, so we're going to do f of negative x. We plug that in. Negative x times negative x times another negative x. That's going to be, this is going to be odd because this becomes negative 6x cubed. What's negative 9 times negative x? It's positive 9x. Is that the opposite of what I started with? I had a positive 6x cubed, now I got a negative. I got a negative and now I got a positive. Everything's changed signs. That's odd. The shortcut, look at the exponents on the variables. This one has a 3. What's the exponent on this x? 1. Both of those are what kind of numbers? Odd numbers. So that's an odd function. There's one other case. Not every function is even. Not every function is odd. There's also functions that are neither. Okay? A neither function, example of that, would be something like this. I know that one's neither without even doing the problem because we have an even exponent, we have an odd exponent, then we have one that doesn't even have a variable with an exponent. Okay? It's mixed and matched. Anything that's mixed up is neither. Okay? If you do the test, you actually do f of negative x and work it out. I'll go ahead and do that just so I'm showing you. Well, that's going to give me 3x to the fourth. It stayed the same. But the next one turns into positive 5x cubed. It changed. The 2 didn't change. That doesn't match the original. And everybody didn't change. Only one person changed. Or one piece, one term. So that is a neither situation. Maybe you're from northern Decatur County. Neither situation. Okay. So neither, neither, either one, it's a mix and match. Even, all the exponents are what? Even. If it's odd, all the exponents are odd. If it's mixed up, it's say what? Neither. Neither. That's the easy part, okay? Suggested problems for these particular sections uh, in 2.3. In the previous edition, it was page 199. Uh, I'm not sure what page it is in the new edition. 1 through 85, whatever, 2.3, 1 through 85, whatever that, that gets you. And then 2.6, uh, the old edition was 238, whatever that page number is where the problems are in 2.6. 1 through 5, uh, 7, 8, 11, 16, something like that. Some of those. And then 2... Seven, some suggested problems there. Uh, old edition was 253, Let's do one through 93, just any of those odd ones out of that, just some of each one. Get you ready for your Canvas quiz. Canvas quiz will be posted, should have an announcement, it's got a review for the test next week. That review also has an answer key with it so that you can check and make sure. Email me if you got questions about any of those things. Uh, uh, keep a check on your canvas. Uh, we will start at 545 next week. <laughs> Sorry about the confusion this week. That's my fault for being just a complete dummy. Uh, so.